Uh, welcome. This is an exciting one. Uh, I think a few people are looking forward to this one about standard 2C. We'll get into the details of that in a little bit of why, but before we get that far, um, as we always do, we're time stamping this. This is recorded on April 18th, 2022. Um, and the reason we timestamp this is because they're always available on the Knackles news blog and our YouTube page. So if you happen to be watching this down the road, maybe a month, two, two months from now, um, please double check with the documents on our website and staff to make sure you have the most up-to-date compliance language. Um, the compliance language can change at least twice a year after the board meeting, and we have a board meeting later this week. So while I there is 99.9% .9 chance that none of the standard language you will see here will change, but just to please remind you that um, vigilantly make sure you have the most up-to-date compliance language when you're working on these items. Um, the team today, we have two content experts to tackle standard 2C. Park Chair, Laura Ahonen, she's the Program Director at North Central Technical College. And from RCAP, uh, MLS educator, um, Don Tripolino, she's the program director, director at Bayfront Health St. Petersburg. Also joining is Jesse Jasso. Um, she's a prog program accreditation coordinator and review liaison. Um, and my name is Mark Spence. I'm a program approval coordinator. So the reason we are talking about standard 2C today is because it is the most cited standard um, since we started collecting data on this since uh 2014. so before we get to that data let's look and see what the standard language is so standard 2c is under our assessment and continuous quality improvement section it is program assessment and modification the results of program outcome measures and assessment must include findings from graduate and employer feedback and be one reflected in ongoing curriculum development resource acquisition slash allocation and program modification and two, analyze to demonstrate the effectiveness of any changes implemented. So in preparation for this uh, Dr. Knackles session, I went back to our uh, frequency of standard citations document that we update after every um, board meeting. And what you're seeing here is how often this uh, these standards are cited among all standards of all, uh, I mean, all citations of all standards. So of all the full citations the Board of Directors has um, voted on in all the awards since 2014, Standard 2C is cited uh, about a third of the time. And for all the partial citations that we see uh, it, since 2014, Standard 2C is uh, cited about a quarter of a time. So considering, I didn't count them up, but you know we have eight full standards and substandards for each section. This is a significant point of citations for programs uh, that go through our process. So now I will hand it over to uh, Don Triplino as we start getting into kind of the meat of uh, the standard. Well, good afternoon. This is Don, like Mark said. Thanks for the um, background information, Mark. On Standard two, just like Mark described, it, it does, it's a stumbling block for a lot of folks. If you seem a little confused, you're not alone. It is often cited and most of the time people are doing, or the program directors are doing the activities, but documentation may not be reflecting everything that's going on. Also wanna just take a step back and look at the whole of the standard for just a moment. We're looking at part C. Um, Part A just says you have to have a continuous and systematic assessment program. So it, that is where the reviewers or the site visitors are really gonna look to see what to expect as far as how your information is gonna flow. Uh, part B says you should have three active years of documentation that's analyzed and used. And then has these nice little um, bullet points. It says there'll be external certification rates, graduation rates, placement, attrition, and then other, and it gives you some suggestions of others. And those are, um, as lab people, those are sort of quantifiable things we can look at and grab onto. And then we get to 2C and it says, well, all of that. And then you have to have findings from graduate and employer feedback. And that has to be brought into your, to your overall process, which this graphic describes really clearly. It's um, you plan, you, um, you, well, you see an issue, you 
have those nice quantifiable benchmarks, but then you also have this feedback system too from your graduates and employers that have sort of come into the plant into the process now. So you uh, have some feedback or uh, an issue you want to look at, you plan, you try something, you implement it, you collect some data, you see if that worked or not, and then you monitor it in an ongoing basis, and then then it circles back around. Um, if you I. I'll just clarify, I come from a hospital-based program and the standards and the compliance guide are the same for whatever kind of program you are involved with, but sometimes it just looks a little different. And fortunately, my partner here today, Laura, is from the college uh, environment. So, um, but we all review all types of programs and all, um, you know, all perspectives, but it just, um, sometimes it, it requires a little bit of adjustment. If you are in a lab, like, like I am, most of my day is spent in the hospital laboratory, that little graphic right there looks a lot like your laboratory quality assurance plan. Everyone who is CAP or Joint Commission has a plan in place, and it's the same process. And in fact, my programs happens to look a lot like the hospital's plan. It just sort of overlays. Um, when we start transferring that to the uh, learning environment, sometimes it gets, a, it seems to be a, a, become a little gray, but it really is much the same. Um, Mark, if you wanna pop to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as I've mentioned, this does incorporate the feedback from graduates and employers. Now, how you obtain that, um, that feedback uh, and get and that documentation does look a little different. And in my environment, much of that feedback actually comes uh, directly because we tend to retain our graduates. I work with these folks, I can ask them, I see the managers. In the situation where a graduate leaves our program, I, we do have surveys where I know in other environments and programs that I've reviewed, there is a rather elaborate system of data collection and feedback. Now you may not always get it, but I think Laura is gonna describe when that situation arises. But bringing that in into the mix with these other um, benchmarks, or we're used to thinking of them as QA monitors, if you will, and from part B is getting this feedback into the process uh, sometimes becomes uh, hard to document. And it's going to look different based on how you handle your program and how you handle your information. Uh, it usually involves the advisory board, uh, program faculty, and that's your didactic and or the clinical. So if you have um, rotation sites that are not there right with you, you're incorporating those folks into the, pro in, into the process. Um, we don't particularly have a curriculum team, but I know many programs do. So again, it, it may vary a bit depending on where you're at and how you're pulling it in. Um, much um, of my feedback, as I mentioned, happens to be anecdotal. I document it in my quality assurance plan. And I'm sure many of you out there have questions or ideas or even better ways of bringing it in so that the reviewer and your site visitor can read it and see exactly how you're getting this and how you're pulling it in. And most importantly, entering it into your ongoing process of, well, gee, we tried this. Did that work? No. Let me look at this again. Did that work? No. Hopefully you get to a yes and you can close it out. But that, that's how we want to capture um, really the quality, uh, the continuous quality process for your program. And I think there's, do I have one more slide, Mark, or are we going to switch to Laura now? I think um, we'll switch over and and if you could keep it on the slide for one one more second, Mark. I just want to mention that as a um, self study reviewer, one of the um, items I see where programs lack information um, to meet the standard is when we look at standard two C one. You need documentation that you're evaluating your program outcomes. So most programs have the um, certification exam scores, the graduation and attrition rates, and the employment rates, those three program outcomes are discussed at their advisory boards. And so they have documentation that they've reviewed those program outcomes with advisory. Um, most programs have those outcomes reviewed by faculty. 
that at faculty team meetings, maybe it's in their team meeting minutes, but they've reviewed certification exam scores. Maybe they're weak in one area and they need to beef up some kind of education in that area. But where I've seen the most problems is um, looking at feedback from graduates and sometimes getting feedback from employers is also an issue. But what I've actually seen submitted in self-studies is that a program would um, have their program outcomes evaluated by advisory, by faculty, but there, there's no evaluation of the program from a graduate perspective. And programs will write something in that um, self-study, such as um, graduate surveys sent out but we have a zero response rate from graduates of our program. Well, that's not really meeting the standards that you've sent out surveys. We actually need that feedback from the graduates. So that's something to really think about. And there's maybe during the Q&A, people can share methods that have helped them improve their graduate response rate. I know, um, some programs have incorporated social media. Maybe they have a Facebook or Instagram alumni page, and that way then they have contact with their graduates. And when they need to get these um, graduate feedback, they can use those social media pages. That's just one idea that I've seen um, programs use that have been pretty successful. So I just wanna point that out just because you've surveyed graduates, if you get zero responses, uh, that still doesn't meet the standard. You do need responses from your graduates. Okay, you can go to that next slide, Mark, please. So standard 2C is, I'm sorry, 2C2, is that if you look at your program outcomes or that graduate and employer feedback, and you decide you need to make a change based on any of those items, Many programs make a change and they say, well, we've changed the order of classes or we have changed um, our evaluation systems or we've made a, some change because of any of those other items. But then that's where it stops. What needs to happen is then maybe a year later, you look at those same program outcomes and say, well, we made that change and now our board scores have improved or they've decreased or stayed the same. But you have to show in writing, somehow document that after you make a change based on any of those quality measures, that you evaluate the effectiveness of that change. And um, that can be done in a number of different ways. There's a number of different tools people have. If we think about that very first um, infographic that Mark had showed with those little circles, that, cir that black circle at the end where you're looping back to collect more data, that's um, standard 2C2. So you can collect data, plan for something, implement it, make a change, but then you want to also collect more data and go back to evaluating that change. And you're always sort of circling and doing that loop. Now, um, <clears throat> for my program, it's as simple as an Excel sheet. So we have all of our um, curriculum program modifications that we do. We put the year that we do it. And then there's another column where the next year we evaluate the effectiveness of that change. And that's a simple way to do it and to just remember to collect that data afterwards. So, but that is where a lot of 2C2 gets cited is because of the failure to evaluate any changes made. So if you can go ahead to the next slide. And this next slide is just verbatim from the standard compliance guide regarding um, the site visit. And this is just saying that at the site visit, the supporting documents are going to be reviewed again as to how was the data collected? Were you using um, your ASCP board of certification scores? How was that data reviewed and evaluated and all of that documentation? So that will be verified as on a site visit as well. I don't know, Don, did you have any 
things to add for 2C2? Anything you've seen as you've done self-study reviews? Um, yeah, I would like to take a chance uh, to mention that I, I too, am, I'm personally a spreadsheet person, but you mentioned the, you know, the Excel spreadsheet. That's excellent. That's a perfect way for someone to get the overview and see what you've done. However, sometimes there's not enough if you have a really uh, significant, maybe a little bit lengthier, um, a curriculum change, something that you want to track in a little bit more detail. Um, sometimes a separate, just refer to a separate report and then we'll really break that down and do an analysis of that one particular, um, whether, for instance, you need to make a curriculum change to to an immunology course um, and you want to monitor it. Maybe, maybe there's multiple parts. Maybe it's curriculum as well as new instructors. That way you have an example. And I think that for reviewers, both um, study reviewers and site visitors as well. Um, it's helpful if there's a, a really detailed example. Uh, looking at the spreadsheets, perfect, it's awesome. And then seeing how uh, a, a more detailed example that really shows the process for one specific issue. I know that we've had a habit of over the years of doing that for, for instance, cap inspections. You would um, show them the plan, but then you always had a ready example to show this is how our process worked or didn't work, to be honest, um, and how we've really stuck with it. So um, I, I think that I just wanted to mention that it, it, is, it can be really helpful to your reviewer if you have a good example. And then the site visit, that's your chance. If there has been any um, lack of clarity in the process along the way, by the time a site visit occurs, if you're a program that gets a site visit, um, that's the chance that sometimes it just all comes to light. The, um, it, so it's much easier to see and when you have a conversation with someone, but it does hinge on the quality of the documentation going into the whole process. Anything else, Laura? No, no, I think like you said earlier, most programs are doing these things, um, but it's just not documented and it's not easily able to be seen by a self-study reviewer that the standards are being met. So if you can think of ways to show your self-study reviewer or site visitor that you're, you know, checking all these boxes off in the standards, that's very helpful. Okay, we will be opening up to general Q&A in a little bit. Um, the Q&A can be about anything we've covered here, 2C2, or any que Knackles question in general, it's really, an open forum. Uh, before we get to that, I like to um, put a quick plug in for our DLPs, our discipline lead people. So the names you see here are members of our review committees that are your main contact if you have questions about standard interpretation. And their emails are found on our program directors page on our website. So. Um, if you have a question about process or things like when's my next self-study due, uh, how much are the fees, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you can contact staff. Um, if you don't know where your question falls, please contact staff first um, because our volunteers uh, volunteer their time gracious, uh, graciously. So um, you can always start with us and we can let you know whether we have that base of expertise to give you the answer you need or direct you somewhere else. Um, uh, just keep in mind that these people are really here for, like I said, basic standard interpretation. They're not going to be necessarily able to give a self-study a once over or look at your progress report to see if you are um, doing what is required from you for, for you. They're not that kind of crosses the line into consultation and that gets a little tricky, but if you do, if you do have a progress report and you do kind of need uh, some details on some general standard interpretation of what they're looking for, that specific standard, they may be able to assist you. But if it's a if a crossover that consultation, they will uh, not be able to maybe go as in depth as you would like. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and you can drop them in the Q and A box that you see in your menu bar, or you can raise your hand and I will um, let you turn your mic on and we can go ahead and get started. We do have a couple questions in the Q&A already. Um, so uh, Don or Laura, I'll let you jump in on this, whoever. 
When do you recommend sending graduates a survey? Three or six months after the program completion? And I'm actually, before you take this over, I'm actually glad you brought this up because I know I've seen programs that will give like their former students a survey literally on graduation date and saying, well, that was my graduate feedback when I don't think that was quite the intent of what we were looking for. So um, I'll hand it over to uh, Laura, your box is green on my screen. So I'll let you take the first shot at it. Sure, um, I NACLS is not prescriptive. I can tell you what we do. We do it one year after graduation because that way the graduate has had a chance to be in the workforce for a while. And really what we want to know from our graduates is how well did our program prepare you for work? And we feel like after they've been at a place for a year, we'll get a really um, good solid answer. So that's what we do. I don't know, Dawn, did you wanna give your side? Sure, um, I've seen it done at a year. Um, I happen to do six months. Uh, I think three months they may not be settled in a position yet to give uh, the best feedback. We do six months so I can, um, like I said, many of them stay with us, but uh, that gives a pretty good gauge. They, uh, all, they give me feedback about how they were prepared for the employment, for the workplace, for the department, the specific department that they're in. Uh, the employers, we also send that out at six months. Um, so if they don't happen to be with us, that is the time when the graduate can supply their supervisor or their direct report um, that contact information so that we can reach out to that individual. So I, uh, you, Mark mentioned that some programs do a survey on the day of graduation. We actually do something similar. It's called an exit survey. And it's a couple weeks after graduation. That's when I like to hear how well they uh, felt they were prepared for uh, the, the registry exam if they've, if they've taken it, which they're in Florida, so they, they take it. And it also gives a chance for them to give any last minute feedback about their rotations and their lectures as far as preparation went. So the, those are two separate activities. I don't, um, I, like Mark said, I, I don't think the intent, while they were not prescriptive, the intent was not that for at, when they first get out of the gate, it's after they get settled a bit and go, okay, yeah. How did this all work out for me? Um, the next one's pretty meaty. Uh, do you have suggestions for teasing apart the effects of recent curricular changes and the effects of COVID shutdowns in the spring 2020? Um, yeah, I can start and then hand it over to Don. So uh, I'll take that first part where you have recent curricular changes. Um, what we have done is if we've made for example, recently we made a significant curriculum change to our microbiology course. And so on my QI document where I monitor the subset scores of the ASCP, I put in a little column, um, 2019 curriculum change. And then because of that, what are the scores now? So I kind of insert, uh, informational columns in my running document where I track the scores and that way I can clearly see when I've inserted a change how did that impact those scores on that same page is my um, student my graduate employment and my retention so I'll still have that highlighted where a curriculum change was made and then all in one page I could see the effects of that as far as the monitoring the effects of COVID shutdown in spring, we, I put that in my um, placement rates da data. So again, I have all my years of graduates and their placement rates. During that shutdown, I inserted a column, um, 2020 COVID shutdown, we had a delay in graduation or whatever information I needed to put in and then looking at placements after that, because for us, it felt like that's where the COVID shutdowns affected our students was more on placement rates. Um, so that's just one idea. You can just put it right in your QA document, add in your changes, and then you're still monitoring and you're really seeing the effects of that change. So it's kind of a win-win. You're also addressing 2C2 there as well. I'll hand it over to Don. Um, yeah, I agree. That's a great way of handling it. Uh, Laura did a super job of describing that. 
I think um, when COVID did happen, uh, as far as curricular changes, I tended to look back and it, historical data as well. If I felt like maybe we were having an issue with say microbiology um, prior to uh, the COVID event that changed our lives. Um, if that trend was already in place, then I could maybe make a judgment about how, about teasing apart what was really COVID and what was maybe perhaps a trend occurring anyway. Um, that in the absence of anything like that, I think that it's, it's gonna be hard to, to tease it apart because you know your program very well and you kind of know what happened on that timeline. I, I, the thought also occurs to me that um, we're not really done with COVID yet. <laughs> and some of the changes that were implemented are, are there to stay. Um, I think that we, in our program and my documentation I hope reflects this, is that we've learned that there's a lot more uh, flexibility and nimbleness, if that's a word, that's gonna be needed. Um, COVID was one hurdle. Staffing changes is another uh, extreme challenge that we're facing, which is getting written into the quality plan. That's staffing as in people to, to work with our students, the clinical sites, people to do lectures, the staff shortage. Um, now, whether that's, there's a lot of discussion about whether that resulted directly from COVID or if that was a, a wave that was occurring, the re retirements that were going to happen anyway or the career changes. Um, that's a tough one, but I think uh, using your historical data and and your intuition, your professional judgment about um, and expressing that and including it in your documentation, I think those are ways to to help you with that. And I hope that answers some of that question. Uh, it looks like Tracy, who asked that first part, has a follow up. Okay. We also did a significant micro change, but the first year we offered the course was spring 2020 when they missed half the in-person lab. If there was no improvement, was it COVID or the new course not doing what we intended? Oh, I see. Oh, uh, man. That's almost too early to tell. Maybe you just have to continue to monitor that since, like uh, Dawn said, we're sort of still in COVID, but it's not as 2020. So maybe you just need more data. It sounds like you don't have enough at this point to figure that out. Yeah, I think that this is Dawn. You may just keep it on your on your spreadsheet for a little bit longer. It's they, no one says that you have to take one action and figure it all out. Just keep keep monitoring, try different things, and um, keep your keep your finger on that pulse, I guess, if if you will. Um, that's all the questions in the chat. Give it a little longer. Uh, again, you can raise use the raise hand function and we can do it um, over the computer audio as well. I will say while we are kind of waiting for a little bit, um, we don't have a date yet for the next uh, Dr. Knackles, but the topic is items of interest for new program directors. So it'll be new program director focused. Um, we have seen, I don't know if we can call it unprecedented anymore because it's been like this for five years, but significant turnover of um, program directors between program, uh, programs. So we have a lot of, a lot of new folks entering the mix. As Jesse can tell you, because that takes up a lot of our time. What's that? Are there a lot of new programs as well, or is it mostly just turnover? Um, our numbers are steady knackles if you saw the knackles update um we kind of at click we kind of presented some data that overall over the past 20 years our numbers are pretty steady so we have a few join and maybe a few that withdraw uh -huh. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I won't take up anybody else up any anybody else's time. Again, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you to our volunteers who are on the call. I see a couple, a um, couple former board members, a few uh, committee members, and some reviewers. Thank you to Lauren Dawn. Um, if you have any questions, please always feel free to contact staff. Uh, keep an eye on the Knackles News when we'll announce the next. Um, uh, the next Dr. Knackles, including something, and also a plug on the uh, Knackles news today was 
uh, an updated version of a classic objectives, objectives document that we've had around forever. And our cap chair, Andrea Gordon, took the lead on kind of updating that um, and modernizing a little bit with the assistance of other uh, our other review committee chairs. So if you have not seen that yet, I will encourage you to go read that. So um, everybody else enjoy the rest of your day.